So I'm going to attempt to work the clicker and my notes um, at the same time. I can't promise you it will go well, but um, I will do my best. So a little bit about me. Um, so I was born and raised in Auckland. I lived overseas um, the first time when I was four. My father is from Croatia, so we went back for three months when I was four. I don't remember much of that. We went back again when I was eight, and um, I had to go to school, so I remember that a lot more. The thing I remember most is that in the summer, school finished at noon, so I got to spend all of the afternoon on the beach, which I thought was a much better system. <laughs> um, I then went on my first OE and lived in Scotland for two years in 1998. And then in 2005, my then boyfriend, now husband, and I left New Zealand to go off adventuring. And we went to the Netherlands because my husband has Dutch parents, so he had a Dutch passport, and we thought that would be a great place to go. We then moved to the UK and then the US, that should say, and came back in 2017. So I have a lot of experience personally of, of moving around and living and working in different places. And then in my professional life, I'm a talent development manager and leadership development specialist. So we used a lot of mobility as a development tool. So we moved a lot of people to different locations to gain work experience, particularly with leadership <coughs> development. Um, if we're developing leaders of global organisations, we want them to have experience in different markets. So I've also kind of um, moved people around for professional reasons. Um, since I've come back, I've started a blog called How to Have a Happy Homecoming, which is actually about repatriation and the experience of coming back to live in New Zealand. And I interviewed um, a bunch of people from all over the world who've come back to live in New Zealand. So, um, and I'm married with one cat. So what I'm gonna do tonight is talk you through at quite a high level um, the experience of being a Glomad. And to start off, as all good talks do, with a definition, what is a Glomad? Well, it's a made up word that I made up to try and kind of describe what I mean. So the first part is global. So this is to do with being a citizen of the world or having a kind of global outlook. So it's about how do you kind of see yourself? You know, are you just, you know, from Auckland? Is that your main identity? Are you a New Zealander? Or do you see yourself as somebody who's kind of a citizen of the world and you have an international orientation? One of the defining characteristics, though, if you're going to be a glomad, is that you have to also be really good at becoming a local very quickly. You have to be able to grow where you are planted. You can't just go and live in other places and kind of be a, a hostage until you get to leave. Um, and then there's the nomadic part. Glomads move around. And so in that sense, they're quite different to immigrants who move to one place and stay there forever. Um, so how do you become a glomad? The common paths. Um, one that's becoming even more common is the self-initiated. A lot of New Zealanders kind of go off and do this. They get their OE. Um, their working holiday visa, they go, they do two years somewhere, they're not quite ready to come back, so they move somewhere else, then they move somewhere else, then they move somewhere else. It can be quite accidental, usually because they're a bit bored and they want to have a sense of adventure or they're not quite ready to settle down and get a proper job, all these kinds of things. Company transfers are also very common. As I said, if you have aspirations towards leadership, particularly if you're working for a multinational firm, you will probably get the opportunity um, to make a move overseas. If that's kind of what you're interested in, then you, know, you, you need to be um, aware that this is increasingly becoming a requirement for multinational firms. And then there's the trailing spouse. So um, often, if your partner has moved for their career, you will go with them to support them, and you are kind of considered the appendage. But you go through exactly the same experience that they go through um, 
but your happiness in lots of ways is actually more important. So the number one cause of assignment failure, someone who's been sent to another country by their company, is um, that the spouse is unhappy. So when the employee has to choose between their partner or their job, they'll usually choose their partner, not always, usually. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so they're, they're a very, very important part of this process if you are traveling as a couple or as a family. So what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna talk you through what I call the glomatic lifestyle cycle, which some of you will recognize um, as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the reason I use this is that a few years ago, when I had just moved to the US, a friend that I'd made in the Netherlands got in touch with me, and she had moved for the first time ever to another country. Um, she was about 41 at the time, and her partner had got a job in Indonesia, in Jakarta. So she had gone, thinking it would be a great lark, and um, three months in, she sent me this email saying, you have to help me, I don't know what I'm doing, I can't cope, how do you do it? And she's got a similar background to me, she was in leadership development and, and kind of organisational development, and I thought, how can I explain it to her in a way that will make sense and also kind of give her some structure with which to understand this experience? So this was kind of doing the rounds on Facebook, and I thought, actually, that's perfect. That's exactly what it's like. Every time you move to a new place, you start at the bottom of the pyramid again, and you have to work yourself back up it. So this process that I'm going to walk you through tonight, that's something that you will go through regardless of how you got there. So it doesn't matter if you took yourself, it doesn't matter if the company transferred you, it doesn't matter if you're the trailing spouse. The process of getting settled in a new place, of establishing yourself in a new place, that's going to more or less follow this. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can increase your globality quotient, another made-up term. Don't look for it in your OB textbook, it won't be there. <coughs> But it is a set of skills and an ability, a set of abilities that you can learn and you can develop. So the more practice you get, the better you become at it. Um, members of the same family may experience the process in different ways. And, of course, you do need Wi-Fi to do anything these days. So um, I'm just going to give you some examples from my own experience. Obviously, this is a massive topic. Um, but what we will have at the end is about 20 minutes of Q&A, so if you've got something specific that you want me to go back to, write it down and, and ask me at the end. So the first thing that you're probably thinking is, well, if I'm going to go and live in another country, I'm going to need a job. And jobs are interesting because they're related to the safety element, they're related to security, and for a lot of people, they're also related to self-esteem. Practically, in order to work somewhere in another country, you need the legal right to work there. So that means that you need to have some sort of work visa. Now, whether or not you, if you take yourself, you will be responsible for making sure that you're legally entitled to work somewhere. So you need to do your research and find out what kind of visa you need. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this when I give you some kind of advice on um, practicalities. If you have a residence visa, you may be entitled to live somewhere, but you may not be entitled to work there. And that's a particularly important point for some of the trailing spouses. So for example, when my husband and I moved to the US, he was on a intercompany transfer executive visa, an L1, which meant I was on an L2 which gave me the right to apply for a work permit so that I could then apply for jobs. If he'd been at a different level, he would have been employed given an HB visa, which meant I would have got an HB2 visa, which would have meant I couldn't work. So the technical aspects of visas are really important and you need to do your research if you're going to um, live and work somewhere. If a company employs you and they sponsor you for a visa, that also means that your right to live in that country is tied to that job. 
So if you leave the job, you may have to leave the country. So lots of kind of technical things to do with visas. My, the main takeaway from this is really, really do your research. So if you are being moved by your own company, you want to find out what visa you're on and what that means for any partner you might be taking with you. If you are applying for a job overseas and you're having to sort out your own visas, you know, sometimes it's actually worth employing a, um, a consultant to actually help you with this. And then there are the cultural norms around jobs. So time frames. I remember a few years ago there was um, a number of articles in the Herald from young people who'd gone to London and they were really disappointed by how long it took them to get a job. You know, it was taking them three months to get a job, six months to get a job, and they thought this was outrageous. But the reason it takes you six months to get a job in the UK is that if you're a professional, your notice period is three months. So do the maths. So I resign from my job, I give a three month notice, my company then decides, okay, we need to advertise to find someone new, so it takes them a couple of weeks to put the job ad out there. The rec you know, applications come in, they do the long listing, they do the short listing. You know, maybe a month, six weeks go by, then they're ready to do some interviews. They do the first round of interviews, they do the second round of interviews. And then somewhere maybe two months after I've resigned, they make an offer. This person considers the offer, they accept the offer, and then they resign and they have to work out a three-month notice period. So we very easily get to six months. Now, of course, if you are looking for quick employment, you might consider doing some temporary work, but if you're like, no, I'm going and I'm gonna get the perfect job, do some research, find out what's actually going on in the field that you're going into. Don't assume it's gonna be the same as New Zealand because it's, it probably won't be. Tax and other deductions are totally different. And if you move around a lot, if you're a true Glomad and you're moving every three or four years, you have this fabulous thing they call a trailing tax liability, um, which follows you for many years to come. And <laughs> it means that every, every year you may have to do two or three tax returns. So we currently, we've just moved back from the US, we do a UK tax return. We do a US tax return and we do a New Zealand one. And I say we, I mean EY does it, but we have to provide the paperwork. And just to make things even more fun, New Zealand's tax year runs from when to when? 1st of April to 31st of March. The UK is 6th of April to 5th of April. And the US is the 1st of January to the 31st of December. So, lots of fun. Um, so jobs, I would say, talk to your employer. If you work for a multinational firm, find out what their policy is on providing overseas opportunity, what kind of um, relocation packages they offer, and really ask them some you know, deep questions on the visas. You can get in touch with local recruiters in any other country and kind of say, this is what I'm thinking of doing. And then, of course, there are the expat forums, and I'm going to talk about um, those a bit more coming up. Finding somewhere to live um, is also probably pretty high on your priority list. It may be the first thing that you want to do, but in lots of countries, until you've got a job, you're not going to be able to get a flat. So looking into how you're going to um, do this, I would suggest if you've got a place in mind, you find a Kiwis in group. So there's lots of them, Kiwis in Switzerland, Kiwis in Barcelona, Kiwis everywhere, and start asking questions about how do I actually find a flat. You wanna double check things like minimum lease and notice periods. Again, you know, in countries like the Netherlands and the UK, you normally have a fixed term lease. And if you break the lease, you are still liable to pay the rent until the end of the lease. And even if you give notice, it's probably going to be something that you have to give them three months' notice on. So even with the leases set to end on a particular day, you still have to say three months ahead of time whether you want it to end on a particular day. So, you know, the New Zealand kind of rental market is very, very different. It's quite fluid. Um, 
And then buying houses overseas is even more complicated. So I'm not going to go into it. If you want to find out what it's like to buy and sell a house in different countries, go to one of these Kiwis in forums and start asking questions. So just to give you some examples of what might be different. So in the Netherlands, if you get a flat, an unfurnished flat, it literally means there is nothing in there. When people move, they take their light fittings, they take their floorboards, they take their kitchen, um, they take the curtains. So, um, you, so if you're only going for a short period, I'd suggest you find a furnished flat, pay a bit more, it's definitely worth it. A one year lease is standard, and be aware you are most likely going to be signing a contract in a foreign language, so you want to find out you know, what you're actually doing. So multilingual lawyers are your friend. Um, in the UK, furnished flats are more common. Again, the one-year lease. And the minimum notice clauses are strictly enforced. So if you say you're going to leave earlier, you will still have to pay. Um, and the UK buying and selling process is very complicated. So, you know, don't necessarily assume that you're going to move somewhere, buy a place, flip it when you want to leave, and it's all going to go easily. So do a bit of research. Um, in America, basically, you can do whatever you want. You just have to pay for it. So if you have a one-year lease, it'll be a certain amount per month. If you want a six-month lease, it'll be a little bit more per month. Three months, a little bit more. Month by month, it'll be more expensive. Um, you want to check your lease agreements to see what's included because some will include your utilities and some won't include your utilities. So you need to kind of read the fine print. Um, shopping. This is not rude, this is Dutch. And lemonade mit prick is just fizzy lemonade. So one of the things that I kind of want to convey tonight is how the little things are the things that can be the most challenging. So going to the supermarket, and you might sort of think, well, if it's a foreign language, I kind of get that, you know, I'm not going to be able to understand what it says. But even in English, you may find that there's different words for things. The brands are certainly different. Um, at the moment, you probably go to the supermarket, you go to the shop, you have your preferred brands, and you know, you know what they say about you. So you know what you want to buy so that it reflects the kind of individual that you are and the values that you have. And then you turn up in this foreign country and those brands aren't there. And all of a sudden, you know, you're having this identity crisis because you don't know what to buy. So you have to kind of start again. Allow at least three times as long to do your shopping. And so, so again, in a foreign country, a foreign language, you think, well, that makes sense. So you have to learn your survival language. You have to learn what are the kind of basic things that I need to understand. You know, if you're buying still water or fizzy water, you want to know what the difference is. Um, but even in an English-speaking country, you might be reading the labels more closely than you do here. So when I moved to the States, I would go to the Whole Foods shop because um, I knew that was healthy. And you know, the one thing I knew about America is that you can't trust the food. So I thought, well, I'll go to Whole Foods because at least then I'll know it's good food. And I would pick things up. Like I would pick up a block of cheese and it would say, no added hormones. And I think that's a bit weird. Does that mean that if it doesn't say no added hormones, I should assume it has added hormones? Um, <laughs> So I'd put it back and then I'd look again at the cheese and then I'd try and find one that wasn't American and I would buy that. <laughs> I bought a lot of Irish cheese. <laughs> I trust the Irish. So, you know, you've got to allow time to get used to things at this very, very granular level. So, and, and to be, you know, kind of flummoxed and overwhelmed and go with a shopping list and come home with three things. Um, the other things that can happen quite often is that things are sold in a different shop to the one that you might expect. So you don't know where to buy certain things. And if you don't have any friends there, if you don't know anybody to ask, you spend a lot of time either trying to find things online 
or wandering the streets, kind of wandering into shops and sort of hoping that you stumble across things. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on safety other than to say that it's really common to feel anxious and insecure because everything is new. Um, and actually, uh, the people that I've interviewed for my blog actually cite feeling safe as the best thing about coming back to New Zealand. So some of that's to do with, um, I think, you know, the geographical isolation, but a lot of it's just psychological safety. It's just being that things are familiar. So if you kind of know what are the dodgy areas, you can avoid them. You move to a new city, you don't know what the dodgy areas are. You'll be blissfully unaware as you wander through them. And it's not until you know, a local friend says, I can't believe you went there, um, that you realise that you were actually taking your life into your hands. Um, ignorance can be bliss and you will adapt. So we lived, we were in London on 7-7. We were meant to go to Cambridge that day. We missed the train. Um, but, you know, you kind of adapt. You're like, oh, well, people are blowing up tubes. You just get on with your life. We were in Ealing during the Ealing, the London riots. I was actually standing at my window watching groups of young men run up and down the street. Um, and on the TV, you know, there were cars being burnt. I was in my pyjamas. I was looking at the neighbour's car, thinking, I wonder if someone's going to burn that car. I should probably go and get dressed. What will I do with the cat? You know, these are the kinds of things, you know. Now, my parents <laughs> are watching it, freaking out, thinking, oh, my God, you're in imminent danger. And I'm thinking, well, actually, my biggest concern was should I put my clothes on and what am I going to do with the cat? You just adapt. So don't worry. Whatever you're seeing on the news about what's going on in other parts of the world, if you live there, this becomes your normal and you, you just cope. You, you'll be fine. Belonging. Now, I'm going to spend a bit more time on this because this is actually the thing that will make or break your experience of being a glomad. And this is to do with a sense of belonging to a place, being part of a community, and at its very basic level, having friends. Now, most of us haven't had to, or hadn't had to make a new friend as an adult. You know, we went to school with people, we went to university with people. People were sort of wonderfully provided for us in close proximity with shared interests. And it was a relatively simple thing to kind of find someone that you liked and, you know, form a friendship and do things together. When you turn up in a new place and you don't know anybody, your phone never rings. You know, you never get an invitation to do something. So you actually have to go out and literally meet dozens and dozens of people proactively to try and make new friends. And that can be really daunting for people. So a lot of people don't do it. Um, and we see the impact of that. In the expat community, we have quite high levels of... Um, some mental health issues around depression and anxiety. We have high levels of loneliness. So it's really, really critical if you're going to go and embark on this kind of lifestyle that you actually get good at putting yourself out there and proactively meeting friends. So I'm just going to walk you through how I met some of my friends in the 12 years that I was overseas. So you see some ideas about how you might do this. So if we start up the top here, um, that's me on the left. The girl in the middle is, is Viviana. She's from Mexico. And this is Jocelyn. She's from New York. And I met them in Rotterdam. And the way I did it was I actually met them online. So I sort of, um, I was working in The Hague for an international organization that supported the international community. Lots and lots of expat groups in The Hague, none that I knew of in Rotterdam. So I said, you know, is there, is there any group that you know of? And they said, well, there's this group called Rotterdam Glam. You know, you could try them. They've got an online forum. And this is 2005. So this is before Facebook. This is before meetups. This is before smartphones. So I went online and, and I found the forum and I wrote in, hello, I've just moved to Rotterdam. Would anyone like to meet for coffee? And um, Viviana and Jocelyn replied, and so did a girl called Mary. 
So we all went out for a coffee and um, Mary was recalled to her home office a couple of weeks later. But the three of us became best friends for probably the first two years that I was in Rotterdam. And we did everything together. And what was really interesting is that when we got talking, we found out that we'd all moved there within a week of each other. So what had happened is that we'd all got to that kind of same stage of the cycle where we'd got settled in, we'd found somewhere to live, we'd found jobs, um, we'd figured out how to do the shopping, and then we were ready to make some friends. We were ready to kind of do that next step of starting to build a community. And that actually rang true for all the friends that I met. So over the five and a half years that I was there, the ones that I met in that first year had all arrived in Rotterdam within a week or two of each other. So we all kind of went through that process together. Um, so here's a question for you. If I was to say to a bunch of you, let's go out for dinner, what time would you assume we would meet? Seven? Seven, six? OK, one of the fun things about living abroad and having international friends is that di you realise dinner is a cultural concept. So this is a group of friends in the Netherlands. Um, and when you say to them, what time shall we have? Let's go for dinner. What time shall we go? The Dutch will go six o'clock because you know that's when dinner is. The Dutch have lunch at 12 and dinner at six. Um, the Argentinians say, well, not before 10, because, oh my God, you know, who would eat before 10? The Italians are very clear, it's 8 o'clock, you have dinner at 8 o'clock, and you have a spritz before you eat, and then you have your dinner, and then you have a, um, a digestive. The Brits are kind of like, well, you know, 8 or 9, um, and we have to meet for a drink first. And the Antipodeans are kind of like, I don't care, I'll just fit in with anybody. And um, the Canadians are, are kind of the same, although they'd probably go for seven. So, you know, you meet these fabulous people and then you suddenly realise that all your assumptions about what's normal is actually not true. They're just <coughs> assumptions. So this is our leaving party. Um, so we've got Dutch, Mexican, Italian, Australian and Canadian. Um, this lovely lady in the middle, she's actually Kiwi, but I met her in Rotterdam, but this is her wedding in Denmark. So the way that I met her was that she developed a website for Rotterdam, and when she was moving to Denmark, she got in touch with the international organisation I was working with to ask if we wanted to take it over. And then we worked out that actually we lived five minutes apart from each other in Rotterdam. We could have been best friends the whole time. Um, but we are good friends now. She now lives back in New Zealand, having gone through various countries, and I went the other way. So when we moved to London, the only person I knew was this girl. Her name's Catherine, and um, I knew her because she worked with me in Rotterdam. And she'd come over, she's English, but she'd come over to live with a Dutch boyfriend and the relationship had ended, so she'd gone back to England, but she wanted to keep her job. So I said, well, our boss said you can work remotely if you come over every month or so. So she would come over and she would stay with me. So uh, we became friends and when I moved to London, she was the only person that I knew. So when we were trying to figure out where we were gonna live, she was the person I was emailing going, what are the good areas to live in London? Um, Adam, up the top there, I met him and his wife through a friend in London when they came to flats it for us. We were going overseas, I put a little note on um, a message board saying, does anyone know someone who'd want to flat sit? Adam's Australian, but that's actually us in Seattle, because he travels about 25 days a month, and so when he was passing through Seattle, we would catch up for a coffee. So you're starting to see how you meet these people through all sorts of different cycles and then you kind of, they become part of your friendship world and they're very international. This is Katie. She, um, I met her in Seattle at an Internations event in the toilets and she's actually, <laughs> seriously, beggars can't be choosers, you will befriend anyone. <laughs> she's one of my, my favourite people in the world. 
originally from New York, but she'd been living in the north of England for 25 years, and her and her husband had decided as their kind of, you know, last hurrah, they were going to come to America and have this adventure. Um, that's actually my cousin in New York, who now lives back in Auckland, and this is Joe, who's a New Zealander that we met in Seattle, and he now lives... Um, back in Raumati. And we met him at a Seattle Christchurch Sister City Association. Yeah, I know, we're not from, not from Christchurch, but they weren't that picky and we needed friends, so <laughs> <laughs> off we went. <laughs> so when you, um, when you move to a new place, if you move somewhere like London, the tendency will be to stick to your own. There are hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders, and you could probably spend decades with, and never actually meet anyone other than a New Zealander. I would really encourage you not to do that if you're going overseas to have an overseas experience. Um, but there are times in the process where you will just be feeling like you need a bit of familiarity and you know someone that you don't have to translate for. So that can be quite handy to have a few Kiwi friends. Um, the other thing that you will get used to is that you just leave a piece of your heart everywhere that you go. You know, whenever you move, you make these friendships, um, they're often quite deep friendships because you've gone through some challenging times together and then you leave them and start again. You know, so their life goes on, you're not really a part of it you're now making new friends, investing in the relationships that you have now. So you kind of get used to that. As you move around, you leave a little bit of yourself everywhere you go. The other thing that kind of happens is that you get really good at feeling at home everywhere, you know, growing where you're planted, doing this quite quickly, but you also feel at home nowhere because you're kind of always temporary, you're always transient. And often the people that you befriend and the relationships that you have are with people who are very, very similar to you. So it can be a kind of a, a strange existence um, in that sense. And then something I'm gonna talk about in a little bit is that this kind of lifestyle can also put an enormous strain on relationships. So if any of you are thinking of kind of heading off with a new partner, um, Wait till I've done my bit on relationships. <laughs> and then self-esteem. So have a think. What makes you feel good about yourself right now? Like, how do you know um, that you're a good person, that you're a worthy person? And how much of this is dependent on external things? So how much of your sense of self do you get from where you went to university, or where you went to school, or your position in the community, or who your family is. So now imagine all of that stripped away. You've turned up in this new place. No one's even heard of New Zealand, let alone the university you went to, let alone the school that you went to. Maybe you don't even have your job anymore. Maybe you're the trailing spouse and you've just gone along. So you have none of that. What do you, where do you get your self-esteem from? Where do you get your sense of self-worth? That's another really important set of skills and abilities that you need to develop if you're going to embark on this lifestyle. You need to be able to figure out who you really are independently of all these kind of external markers around you. And for a lot of people, it's a big chance for reinvention. Um, self-actualization, I'm not going to talk about this. Those who know this model know that when you self-actualize, you become yourself. Um, some people do become themselves. They go overseas and, and they find that once they're stripped of all those external markers and all those uh, influences that formed them, they can actually be themselves. Other people lose themselves and they kind of become battered about by the wings of change to the point that they don't really know who they are. Um, but if you get to this point, you've probably, if you're like me, you've probably just got to kind of level four and then you're off to the new place. So it doesn't matter because you're going to be back to figuring out where to live and, you know, what cheese to buy. <laughs> so why do it? 
Well, I think the best metaphor that I like um, for this is to think of yourself like this little plant down here. So when you start off, you're kind of this little pot, little plant in a pot, and you fill the whole pot. And then every time you move somewhere, you go into a bigger pot, and the pot's a bit big for you, so you have to grow to fit it. You have to put down some roots, you have to expand, you know, you have to kind of grow. And the more that you do it, the more you kind of grow yourself as a person. You learn more about yourself, you learn what you're capable of. It's the most humbling and confidence-building experience I've ever had, in equal measure. So humbling because you get stripped of all your external attributes. So it's really your personality and character that will determine your experience. So if you go out you know, hunting for new friends, and these people don't know anything about you, they're not friends of friends, they haven't been introduced, you're not part of the same social circles, your ability to make those new friends, to meet these people from different cultures, to kind of you know, develop these sorts of relationships, that comes down to you. And when you work out that you can actually do that, that's an enormous boost to your self-esteem. Constantly being put in the position of the novice helps you get really good at learning. So then nothing becomes unmanageable over time. The first time you have to do anything, and when you live as a glomad, you're always having to do things for the first time, um, you learn how to do it. So when you then get faced with a new challenge or a new dilemma, you have some confidence that you're going to be able to figure it out because you figured everything else out up until that point. Every time you do something new and scary, you add to what you're capable of. So you build your self-esteem from the inside out. So a lot of people get self-esteem from external markers. So they get it from you know, their job or what they achieve um, or what other people think of them. But when you start to kind of do these things for yourself and set those challenges for yourself, that really builds it from the inside out. And it doesn't matter if all that external stuff is then stripped away from you again, you carry that with you. You develop the skills of agility and resilience because when you move to a foreign place, you can't control anything. Nothing works. So when we first moved to the Netherlands, um, we still had our kind of Kiwi mentality with us. We thought anything could be solved with a quick phone call to somebody and, you know, you just explain the situation and she'd be right, mate. No, this is not how it happens in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, you just have to fit in and follow the process. And so after a while, you work out that that's what you do. When we moved to England, things were done differently again. And you... You know, you kind of bash your head against it for a few months thinking, well, I could just figure out, you know, kind of the right thing to say. <coughs> but no, that doesn't work. And of course, what you're carrying with you now as normal is not the New Zealand way, it's the Dutch way. So now you think the Brits are weird because they're not like the Dutch, who you used to think were weird because they weren't like the Kiwis. Um, resilience. Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Living this kind of lifestyle will put you through enormous challenges. You know, there will be times that you're thinking, I don't know what I was thinking doing this, but you get through it and you learn that you can cope. Interestingly, these are two of the most sought after competencies in the business world today for exactly that reason. In the business world, we never know what's coming, so we have to be agile, we have to be able to adapt and we need to be resilient, lots and lots of setbacks. So one of the reasons that we send young emerging leaders off to foreign markets to get this experience is to build these very skills. Because if we know that somebody has been, you know, moved from you know, London to Jakarta or moved to China or moved to the Middle East, and they've been able to work it there, they've been able to live there, they've been able to be effective in their job, then they're going to have some really um, valuable skills that mean that if they go into the kind of role that's really uncertain, they're dealing with a lot of ambiguity, they're going to be much better at that than somebody who's never actually had to deal with that kind of ambiguity in their own life. 
and you get to be you. So this is a kind of interesting one. So some people um, find this a real challenge, but if you discover yourself in a foreign land with no, no one has any expectations of you, nobody knows who you are, you get to figure out what you actually like and what you don't like and what you stand for. So for some people, it can be, be kind of a process of figuring that out um, for the first time if up until that point, they've always kind of done what their parents expected of them or they've always kind of followed the crowd in terms of what their friends have done. And so it can be quite a liberating sort of experience. So the practicalities. If you are between 18 and 35 and you want to have a taster, I would suggest that you get a working holiday visa. Now, there's about 30 countries, I think it is, in the world that New Zealanders can get a working holiday visa to. So you don't have to just go to London. You don't just have to go to Australia. You can go to all sorts of interesting places. Lots of countries in Europe, the Netherlands, Germany, um, and it's pretty straightforward. Always double check with the embassy because things can change. And I would say, given what's happening in Europe and America at the moment, like really, triple check, um, and just make sure that the old regulations, uh, you know, that the regulations are not out of date. Um, if you're older than 35, then you're probably going to need to find either an internal company transfer, and so let HR know that you're keen. I know from my own experience as a talent manager that we were always at the strategic level wanting to move people around our different markets. Um, but if people didn't tell us that, we couldn't look out for opportunities for them. So if I would talk to people and they would say, you know, I've got a real interest in, you know, being in the Asian market or something, then I could kind of point them in the right direction or have their name in mind if something came up. But if you're just sitting there thinking, God, I wish I could go and work overseas and you don't tell anybody, it's very unlikely that they're going to come to you with that opportunity. Also have a look in your internal job boards. Um, if you work for a multinational company, they'll probably post all the vacancies internally and you know, kind of keep following up on that. Check out job boards in other countries. If you have a rare skill set, most big companies will pay to relocate you. Um, some headhunters in other countries will even contact you for job opportunities abroad. So, you know, keep your LinkedIn profile up to date if you are interested in working overseas. You might even want to, I don't know if you can do that, indicate you're interested in jobs overseas or if you just need to, you know, put in, interested in jobs and see what comes up. Um, one of the good things about New Zealanders is that we can have as many passports as we want. So if you have a parent or a grandparent who has a, a passport for a different country, you can probably get one of those and then that will take care of your um, visa issues as well. So kind of trawl through the family tree, see um, what passports you can get. In terms of housing, customs, social networks, that sort of thing, I would read up on what to expect on some of the local forums. So there's a website called expatica.com in Europe. It covers a number of European countries and it has all sorts of information, everything from jobs to housing. Um, you know, there are all sorts of little articles like, you know, why do the Dutch do this? Why do the Germans behave like that? Give you little insights into some of the cultural nuances. And often they will have... Um, kind of boards that you can post a question. So if you've got a particular question, you can usually get it answered. Um, th my blog is mainly on repatriation, but in the interviews you can read some of the stories of people who have gone overseas. And um, I think the most interesting thing about those is how few of them, actually none of them, did what they thought they were going to do. So they all went off thinking that their overseas experience was going to go one way and it went some very different directions. So I think it's good to kind of have a, just a flavour of, of what might happen um, if you are thinking of heading off. 
um, you can go on Google and just type in expats in, put in the country name and find other forums. There's pretty much always an Australia New Zealand group everywhere you go in the world. Um, so you can kind of tap into them again as a source of information and when you first arrive, you know, they're good for social engagements. Um, in the Netherlands, I don't think the ambassador had much to do because they're always having parties at their house and if you're one of the New Zealanders in Holland, you always get invited. So, um, you know, it's worth kind of connecting up with these New Zealand societies abroad. Kia Network, is anyone already a member of the Kia Network? Has anyone heard of the Kia Network? Okay, so I'm gonna tell them, they'll be horrified. Um, the Kia Network is a, a global network which represents the kind of Kiwi diaspora and their focus is mainly on trade and creating opportunities for New Zealanders who want to do business abroad. So if you were trying to get into the American market or the European market, there'll be some representatives who would kind of help you do that. They also hold lots of social events overseas. Um, they have some interesting speakers and then they publicize New Zealand events in your local area. So when I was in Seattle, um, it was from Kia that I would always know when Brews were in town playing and, you know, the revamped Alan Min OP, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. So if you join these networks, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on and connect in that way. Um, Internations. Anyone a member of Internations here? So this is another international organisation and they have an Auckland chapter um, and it will be mainly foreigners who live and work in New Zealand. And I would go along for a couple of reasons. One, it's a really good place to practise Hello, Will You Be My Friend? And two, it's a really good place to find out from people who live this kind of glomatic lifestyle, you know, what it's like. And, you know, you could even just ask them, what was it like when you came to New Zealand? You know, what did you find that was different? What was unusual? To give you a sense of the kind of experiences that you might have when you go somewhere else. Okay, relationships. So normally when you're talking about careers, you don't talk about relationships. But if you're going to be a glomad, and if you're going to either travel with a partner um, or you know, have, have, find people when you're over there, you actually have to consider this. So from a practical perspective, look into the visa regulations. Um, as I said before, some countries will have different variations on um, whether a spouse can work depending on the level of the visa that the person gets. Um, some countries will only allow one member of the couple to have a work visa. So when I was in my job in London, we were moving someone from America to our Istanbul office, and her husband was coming with her, or her partner was coming with her. And he had sourced a job, and we thought this is fabulous. And then we found out that if they were married, the Turkish government would only give one of them a work visa. So the race was on, we wanted the visa for our person. Um, and then we found out that they weren't married, which solved the visa problem, but they couldn't live together. So, you know. <laughs> um, which brings me to my next point. Some countries will only allow you to bring, import your partner with you if you are legally married. Um, if you are not legally married, and that means married, it doesn't mean de facto, your New Zealand standing has no bearing in other countries. Um, you need to, you know, kind of weigh that up. Not all countries acknowledge same-sex marriage, so if that's you and you're wanting to travel as a couple, you might need to look into which countries are going to be safe for you to go into. Um, and then if you do have children, you want to consider schooling options for children and who will pay for this. Now, um, most... Most GLOMADs, most people that move around a lot every three or four years, put their kids in international schools. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is 
the, um, the international schools generally have a curriculum, the same curriculum in every country. So it's easier for the children academically to kind of move from, face, from place to place. Um, the other reason is that they, they're usually all taught in English um, or French. There's a French network as well, or German. But the language of instruction is the same, so the kids don't have to kind of become proficient in every language of the country that you move to. But of course, you know, these are fiercely expensive. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars um, over the course of that assignment if you've got, you know, a couple of kids. So if you are moving yourself and you want to put your kids into the international schools, then you need to think about negotiating that kind of into your package if you're accepting a job. If the company's moving you, then you want to make sure that's a part of your deal. If you want to put your kids into the local school, and some people really want to do this because they're like, no, we want to have the full immersion experience, we want the kids to learn the language and all the rest of it, you need to do some research and find out whether that's actually going to be possible because not all countries will allow a temporary resident and their kids to kind of go into the school. And then if there's a language issue, you need to think about how you're going to work around that as well. So all solvable. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people do this every year, but they're just things to kind of consider and do your research on. Um, the deeper stuff. So the divorce rate in the expat community is higher than in the general population. Not surprising, considering the, the strains that your relationship can come under, especially if it's just the two of you and you haven't got any other friends and then all of a sudden you have to be everything to each other and it's all a bit new and difficult and you know you take it out on each other. So it's really, really important if you're thinking about doing this and you have a significant other to be honest about your priorities and your values. Um, you will be tested and I, I mean, I can say from personal experience, my husband and I um, did get married while we were overseas and we, we are still together. So it can make you stronger as a couple but it could also kind of show up any cracks that you've got in the relationship. So you need to be really clear on whether you have the same priorities and you want the same things out of life. Because if you're kind of going and you're dragging someone with you who doesn't really want to go, that's probably not going to end very well. Um, yeah, so the most common cause of assignment failure is an unhappy spouse. And of course that can have career implications. So if you do choose the spouse over the job and you leave the assignment, you know, you have to think about what, what might that actually mean in terms of my future prospects with this company. So, you know, kind of lots to think about. Increasing your globality quotient. So you can actually develop some of these skills while you're here in New Zealand. So practice making new friends. Managing loneliness is the hardest part about being a Glomad. Um, we see higher levels of workaholism, alcohol and drug use, depression and anxiety in the expat community. If you are thinking of doing this, I would start trying to make some new friends now to kind of develop some of those skills and put yourself out of your comfort zone. It's very tempting. Now, see, we didn't have a problem problem um, when I went because there was no social media so I couldn't stay in touch with my friends online but what I hear now is that some people kind of are doing this and they're trying to maintain online relationships with old friends rather than making new ones and that's actually making them even more lonely and depressed um, for a couple of reasons one they have no sense of belonging in the community where they live and the other is that they feel like they're on the outside looking in to what their old friends are doing. So they kind of feel betwixt and between and are not part of anything. Um, there's lots of ways that you can meet new people and internationally focus people in New Zealand. Um, there's lots of meetup groups now. There's internations. Um, you know, there are care events. So you can start to kind of get a little bit involved in this kind of international climatic community while you're here and get a, a sense of what it's like and you know whether you'd like to be a part of it. The other thing you need to do, because if you move overseas and you're setting up and you haven't got any friends, you're going to have a lot of time on your hands. 
So you can need to cultivate the ability to be alone. So if you had a whole week or a whole month to yourself and you knew that the phone wasn't going to ring, no one was going to invite you anywhere, there was going to be nothing, kind of no family um, events to go to, there was kind of nothing, you had nothing to do, how would you spend your time? What would you actually do? So I think one thing that's really important if you're thinking about embarking on this kind of life is to think about some location-independent hobbies and interests. Um, starting a mindfulness practice is useful because it helps you manage the kind of roller coaster of emotions, and that's something that you can do now. Yeah, so one thing about this is kind of interesting. So remember my friend who moved to Jakarta, Aveline, her name was. So this was three years ago, and I said to her, you know, what makes you feel like you? You know, what makes you feel like you're yourself? Because she was totally, you know, a loss. And I said, for me, it's yoga. So I can go anywhere in the world. I can walk into a yoga studio, get on my mat, and I feel like I'm home. And she was like, oh, it's swimming. Swimming's how I feel. So she went off and... She joined a gym and she started swimming and she started working out and all the rest of it. And she discovered that in Jakarta, this was actually quite difficult to do because, you know, she's female and, you know, the norms are very different and, and all the rest of it. So she kind of went through this process and she kept it up. And this year, she co-opened a, a female-only gym with a local Indonesian woman. So she actually took her location-independent hobby that gave her her kind of sanity, made her feel like herself in this new place, and she's actually ended up making that into a business. So her career as a talent manager is probably over. She wasn't allowed to work in Jakarta. She couldn't get a work visa. She had to figure out who she was independent of this very successful career that she'd had for the past 15 years. And this is kind of where she's ended up. So, you know, life... When you go on the road, you never quite know where the road's going to take you, but sometimes it can take you to some pretty cool places. Um, so one kind of final slide before um, I open the floor to questions. When you start talking to people about their overseas lives, they will tell you lots of horror stories. Um, so for example, you might have been in Holland for six weeks, you've applied for a residence permit, you've been turned down, the Dutch government's threatening to deport you, TV doesn't work, you've threatened to sue your landlord, you're not sure if you'll be evicted, you've no friends, and Sunday closing is driving you mad. Six months' time, sponsored as a knowledge migrant, you've got a great new job, fabulous circle of friends, and the Albert Hine, that's the local supermarket, just announced they'll be open on Sunday afternoons in the lead up to Christmas. Or you're in the US supporting your husband's career only to find that while you have a work permit, the UK qualification you have isn't recognised, so you can't actually do what you were planning to do. Two years later, you're headlining at a national conference talking about global perspectives on work-life balance, having been talked into it by your new friend, an award-winning author and documentary maker. Both of those things happened to me, and I survived. And these sorts of things will happen to you too, and you will get through them, and you will survive, and then you'll, you know, tell people about it at parties and they'll think it's hilarious. You know, these become some of your best stories. Remember the time I almost got deported? Remember the time I was um, held up at the Dutch border and put in the room with all the other illegals while they checked my paperwork? <laughs> it was great! <laughs> cool. All right. So I think we've now got about 20 minutes for questions. Anyone want to kick off? I have one. Um, you know that story you had about you know, have dinners and everyone has to fight. Mm -hmm. How do you guys speak this out? Negotiation. So you, um, so in Holland it was actually quite easy because all the kitchens and the restaurants closed at nine. So we sort of had a window um, and we would normally kind of go sort of for the middle ground. And then sometimes you do like a rolling dinner. So some people would come at six and then some would come at seven and some would come at eight. So you just kind of negotiate and, and just really roll, roll with it, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So for me, um, the, the same reasons that we left were the, were the reasons that we kept moving, and it was to do with um, when things became predictable, I got bored, and so I wanted to go somewhere new. Um, so that was what prompted us to leave New Zealand. That's what sent us to the UK. And then when we were in the UK, we were actually going to come back to New Zealand. And then we got asked to go to the US unexpectedly. So we just thought, well, why not? Um, so we kind of did. And the priority was always the experience rather than anything else. So if someone offered us kind of an interesting opportunity to go and live somewhere, we would take it. And the timetable is, it, you kind of go after four or five years or you tend to stay. So those friends that I made who arrived at the same time as me, um, most of them are still there. Viviana took the Glomad thing to a whole new level and she would kind of move countries every three months. I have no idea where she is at the moment. <laughs> I've lost track because she's not on social media. Um, <laughs> every now and again she emails me saying, hello, I'm living in the Maldives. Oh. Um, but the others, they, they stayed and they're essentially immigrants now. They live in, they live in Holland. Um, it takes a year to go through, uh, there's a, a well-documented cycle, you can look it up online, of the first year, and you kind of go through a honeymoon period, then you hate everything, mm -hmm. then you um, kind of remove yourself from the host culture, so, you, so that's when you retreat into anything that's kind of familiar, so you hang out with lots of Kiwis and Aussies, because... Overseas Aussies are honorary Kiwis. They'll do, it's close enough. Um, <laughs> and then by the end of the year, you're kind of, well, it's, it, you know, I like this, but I don't like that. And then you sort of start to settle in properly. Um, but I think it's probably not until your third year that you really feel like I live here, things are familiar, you know, I, um, I know my way around. And you've done most things that you're going to do for the first time, you've done most of them. So you've you know, done a tax return and you've, um, I don't know, got a haircut and you know, all these kinds of things. So all those things that you're doing for the first time, you've usually done most of them by the time you're in your third year. It doesn't get faster, but you know what's coming. And that, I, for me, makes it easier. You're, so rather than thinking, oh my God, I've made the worst mistake of my life. I'm, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. You just think, oh, I'm in that phase where I hate everything. You know, so you still go through it. You still hate everything, but you understand better what you're experiencing. What is the biggest challenge you face while you live overseas? The biggest challenge? Um, Making friends. Making friends is the biggest challenge because you... Um, so I'm, I'm not a natural extrovert, so I had friends who were, just the mo who were just amazing at this. They would be out every single night in a different group, kind of meeting people, um, you know, forming friendships, whereas I would kind of go and then I would, you know, I talk to like 300 people, I only like one of them, you know, and it's kind of difficult to sort of do that. So you really have to put yourself out there and kiss a lot of frogs until you actually meet the people that are going to be your friends. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it depends a bit on how you're moving. So if you are being moved by a company, they will probably pay your relocation costs. So um, your furniture, they might put you up for the first couple of months in corporate housing. Um, but 
you, you do go out and buy quite a lot of stuff. Um, I don't think there's a, a figure that's going to apply to every country. So what I would do is get onto the forums in the place that you're thinking of going and ask people um, how much is it going to cost. Because, for example, if you are renting, you might have to provide, you know, first and last month's rent plus a bond, and that might be, you know, if it was somewhere like New York or Hong Kong, that might be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and if it was, if you went to Cambodia or Burma, it'd probably be a lot less. So you need to kind of do a bit of research and find that out. Um, but I would, if you don't have a guaranteed job to go to, you'd also want to do some research into kind of living costs and then maybe allow for, say, six months that you could support yourself. Yeah. Most of your... Uh, the countries you were in were English speaking. Mm. Yep. In Holland, did you learn the language much, or was that much of a, an obstacle? I mean, was it? Did it make it that much harder than being in an Anglo country? Uh, no, actually, um, the most foreign country I lived in was the US. <laughs> um, not Holland. Um, so I learnt survival Dutch, so I learnt how to recognise food, so I could order food at a restaurant and, and do the shopping. Um, if you learn a language, you can understand a lot more than you can speak. So often um, you would have conversations with some, they would speak Dutch and you would speak English and you'd both understand each other. Professionally, I worked in an international business school um, where the, the business language was English, and one of the reasons I was employed was to um, raise the standard of English in the department, so we weren't allowed to speak Dutch. Um, but I think socially it would have helped if my Dutch was better, because the Dutch have this great tradition of clubs, everyone belongs to clubs, and um, if, I'd, if I'd been proficient, I probably could have gone to, to more things socially like that. Yeah. Um, and the reason America was the most foreign place was actually not just the politics, but it's because they have the imperial system. So I couldn't understand the weather forecast. So, <laughs> or, and every time I went to cook something, you know, using a, a recipe, I would have to Google, what is 180 degrees centigrade in Fahrenheit? So that I would know what to temperature to set the oven to. So it's, it's little, lots of little things like that, you know, make you feel like this is, this is different. Any other questions? Oh, some down the back here. Yeah, you've given some really great practicalities about living in the country when you go there. Mm -hmm. What about when you're preparing to leave a country, whether that's your home country or like yep. one that you've been living in? What are some practicalities about outside of obviously the tax liability? Yeah. What's yep. some other good tips? Um, it relates a little bit to your point. I would say take half as much stuff and twice as much money. So, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of old adage about travelling. So even if you try not to, you will accumulate things. And often people will put them in storage thinking that they're going to want them in the future. No one ever wants it, right? So just get rid of it all. Um, if you are... So, so that would be my first thing. So I look at your things and think, OK, what do I really need to take with me? Um, other practicalities are to do with, I mean, really f little things like changing your addresses and stuff like that. So, for example, I've got a situation now. We've got, you know, American Netflix. Well, we don't have American. It's, it's New Zealand Netflix, but it's linked to our US credit card. And our US credit card... Um, and bank accounts still have our US address because the way that the credit cards are verified is via your address. So if I changed it to our New Zealand address and then I wanted to buy something, it, wouldn't, it would cancel the card. So I left everything in the American situation, but the cards are expiring, so they've sent new cards to our old address. 
So I'm kind of like, well, what do I do now? Do I kind of switch out the credit cards? Or so? so it's these little things which are not very important, but they're just kind of stuff that you might want to take into account. So if you're thinking about leaving New Zealand and going overseas, it's that sort of thing, like when you, um, what are you going to do with your bank accounts here? You know, are you going to take your credit card with you? Do you need to talk to your bank here about what happens once I'm set up over there? Can I change the address? Um, the, the, what you take with you, really have a good look at what you're thinking of keeping um, versus what you're going to take. Yeah. Someone had a question here? Over yeah, here? Are you aware of any changes to the US work for you with this new administration? Um, I am aware that there is a lot of discussion about changing the visas, and so I would, at the time that you're going to get it, that would be the time to ask the questions and find out what's the current status. And the US has dozens and dozens of categories of visas. So it's, if you're doing it yourself, I would hire a, a lawyer who can actually advise you, or an immigration consultant who can actually advise you, someone that's in the US. Um, if your company is doing it, they should have somebody doing that for you. So it's usually EY or KPMG who does the, the tax and immigration for um, company moves. Um, you were talking about uh, trailing tax liability if you're moving around different places. Mm. Is that only relevant if you're still generating income in those countries, or why is it that you're still liable for tax you know, years after you've left somewhere? Um, yeah, so yeah, it depends on whether you are still generating income, and that can be for all sorts of reasons. So you might have um, cashed in some shares or um, have, if you have a, a property in New Zealand and you have rental income. So there's all sorts of reasons that you might have it. And then you may have no income, but you might still be required to file a tax return in that year. So it's, it's something, if you're moving a lot and you, um, if, if you think that applies to you, I would say get a good accountant, someone who's <coughs> experienced in, in the international kind of tax law. And if you are uh, moving with a company, it's like the number one thing to ask for when you're negotiating your relocation package, that you want that tax support for at least you know, a year or two after the assignment's finished. Thanks. No worries. Were you ever attached to any of the countries that you visited? And if so, how did you manage to deal with starting all over again with different countries? Um, I was attached to people in the different countries and I think the way I managed it was to, to, to maintain those relationships. So when I um, moved from the Netherlands to London, I would go, I, I actually, um, it's quite funny, I ended up becoming a client of my former employer. So I would go to Holland and I would, catch up with my friends. By that stage, Facebook had come along, um, which was remarkable. And, you know, Skype conversations, that kind of thing. But the countries themselves, you, to stay sane, one thing that you really need to be able to do is to move somewhere and like instantly kind of forget that you ever lived there. Um, because otherwise you, you spend way too much time living in the past and then you can't really start to live in your new home. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Hey, do you think there's a optimum age or like stage in your life to do this? No. No, any age. Um, when I was in London, there were women coming over in their 50s and, you know, they'd kind of had their kids, kids grown up, gone, they'd had their career here and they just wanted a bit of time to explore, um, they set themselves up, they travelled, they got great jobs, you know, so I think any age is a good age to do it. On the back of that, do you think once you become a global man, does it ever stop? Like, do you ever... 
He came back mm. to New Zealand, you said, and yeah. do you feel settled or do you still feel like it's going to be a new opportunity at some stage? I, I think it, 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 it's, it's a great lifestyle. One of the reasons that we came back was, you know, for, there were some pull factors to do with parents and all the rest of it. But for me, it had become predictable. So coming back to New Zealand, this is actually really different. Um, but I've got no doubt that we'll go somewhere in the future. And I think most people who live this way kind of feel the same. So, you know, they might go back to their home country for a number of years, but they'd never rule out going and living somewhere else overseas. Was it hard for you to start going to your first country? Or did you wait some years and... No, well, I mean, as I said, I mean, my first experience was when I was four. Um, so I think the die was kind of cast fairly early on. And then my, my OE to Scotland, I didn't do that very well. I didn't, you know, I was in Edinburgh and um, my boyfriend at the time was Scottish. And we didn't, we knew a couple of people, but we didn't really know people. We just worked all the time and traveled and we didn't kind of really establish ourselves there. So I knew that that was the wrong way to do it. So when I went to the Netherlands, I kind of worked out what I hadn't done in my previous experience. So I was really, really proactive about um, investing that time. And then I took that as my key learning. So when I moved to London, I negotiated with my employer to work virtually for them for six months so that I would actually have time to go and put all this you know, time and energy into meeting people so that I wouldn't just be kind of working you know, those 12 hour London days. Um, and it wasn't until I'd established a social network that I was like, okay, well now I can go and get a, you know, a local job um, where I, I don't need to be so flexible with my time. Mm -hmm. How much of a disadvantage do you think it is looking for a job overseas from here as opposed to actually? Because mm. obviously, you spend money just yep. your wheels over there, we could work here at the same time. Um, how much of a disadvantage is it to the person looking? Yeah, like, uh, do you sort of push it well to one side if a candidate would come in who's not present or not able to be present? It depends on, on your skill set and how. Um, how sought after you are. So, I, th I mean, there's no doubt that being physically present is an advantage, because what that shows is that you're serious and you're, you've made that commitment to move. Um, because sometimes people will say that they're coming, but you know, they're, they're not, they haven't even spoken to their wives. I used to be in recruitment before I left um, New Zealand, and we would recruit a lot of people over from the UK and Australia and we'd often get to sort of third interview stage and, and be ready to offer and then they go, I've you know, better talk this over with my wife who'd been completely oblivious the whole time. Um, so I would say if you are really serious and you can go, go and apply on the ground. Um, but certainly get in touch with recruiters overseas and kind of let them know that you're around because they'll be the ones who send you the opportunities. And for, for sure, companies will bring you over if you're the right person and you've got a rare skill set that they're looking for because the alternative is they don't hire anyone and, you know, that doesn't work. Sorry. How do you deal with that accessing medical services in different countries? Well, it depends on the country. So that is, um, so there's the, there's the, there's different elements. So there's, the NHS is the easiest because it's um, public and it's free at the point of service. So you just rock up to a doctor or a hospital. Um, but Every country has its own rules. So in the UK and in the Netherlands, for example, there are only certain medical centres or hospitals that you can go to depending on either where you live or what insurance you have. In the US, um, your health insurance will usually be provided by your employer and then that health insurer will tell you which hospitals it covers and which practitioners it covers. So again, if, 
particularly if you're going to go to the US, um, even Canada, but the US in particular, you know, this is something that you really do want to look into because there is no safety net. So if you don't have health insurance, then you will have to pay for any treatment that you get and it will run into the tens of thousands. Um, you, there are also some reciprocal agreements between certain countries, so you'd again, you know, maybe want to look into that. But if you are living in a place and you're paying local tax to that country and it has a social welfare system that includes health, then you will probably be covered, but you might just need to find out whether you need to register with a particular doctor's surgery or a particular dentist um, according to the area that you live. And these are the sorts of questions that are really good to ask the, the expat forums, the people who are living there, because they will have found this all out before you get there, um, so you can really learn from their experience. Is that it? Cool. Well, that was great. I don't think we've had as many questions as that in any other <laughs> Oh, see, I've got a question. Who's still going to go? Yay! <laughs> You're welcome, I got scared. <laughs> 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 well, half of the business school, I'd like to thank Trisha for coming in and doing this session. Um, it's not often we get to have external people come in and speak who are also alumna of the university and the business school, so thank you. You're welcome. A small gift, a token of our Lovely. thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.